Hi, we are on Luke 22 of 24, and we're in the 11th of the 12 biblical periods of the Great Adventure Bible Study, Bible Program, um, and the 13th of the 14 narrative books. Now, today we're going to do something a little different because we're getting at the very last covenant. This is the last covenant. Um, and we're going to do, uh, 22, the beginning, and then we're going to do the covenant because Jeff Cabins has a great, um, uh, summary of the covenant and it's just beautiful. So I really want to share that with you. So we're going to do that today and then we'll finish, um, Luke 22 tomorrow. So, okay. So let's get started. Okay. So here we are. Um, and we are at the climax of, of this book, the Bible. Um, the conspiracy to kill Jesus. The most traumatic part is usually the climax, right? So it's almost Passover. And the chief priests and the scribes are were trying to figure out how to put Jesus to death. But they're worried that the people would interfere and turn on them. Um, but as usual... Satan is at work and finds the most willing soul ready to serve him. And um, Breakthrough has it entitled on Luke uh, 22, 3, as Judas agrees to betray Jesus. So it says here, as Sa Satan entered Judas Iscariot, and how does Satan enter us? Well, through our weaknesses. How did they find a willing soul? through his weakness. He, Judas was the treasurer of the group, and he was a greedy man, evidently, and Satan knew that, and Satan knows our weaknesses because he's watching us, looking for them, trying to figure out where he can use us to do his evil deeds. And so he used Jesus, or he used Judas's weakness of greed to take down the Son of God. Um, we have to be very careful of our weaknesses. That's how Satan gets in us. Greed, jealousy, you know, all the seven deadly sins. And um, it says here, Judas Iscariot, who was one of the 12 apostles, um, goes away and has a private meeting with the chief priests and captains so he can betray Jesus for money. So, of course, the chief priests were very pleased and offered to pay him. And Judas started looking for a good chance to hand Jesus over to them without the people knowing about it more in private um, so that they could not interfere. You know, if there was a crowd around him that, you know, he was very magnetic and people loved him, obviously. They knew he was the son of God and they were surrounding him and they would have protected him. So they looked for a very uh, time where there would be fewest people around. And just like for us, our weaknesses can destroy us and we can destroy ourselves through our weakness, which is ultimately what Judas um, of Iscariot does. Um, so uh, this is the, the covenant and we're going to do that in a minute, but we're going to continue this little beginning part of 22. Um, so you can see there's a key event there. Um, and that is the preparation of the Passover. Um, so, uh, let's see. Okay, so, then came the day of unleavened, unleavened bread on which Passover, the Passover lamb was to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat it. They said to him, what will you have us where will you have us prepare it? And Jesus said, um, Behold, when you have entered the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Now, how does he know this? He knows everything. Just remember that. A man carries a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house which he enters and tell the householder. The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I am to eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished there, make ready. And then he went and found it. And as he told them, they found it. They went and found it as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. Now, let me read 
this part to you, this key event. Um, Jesus institutes the Eucharist as a sign and memorial of his passion, telling the apostles, do this in memory of me. In this way, and that's how we do our Eucharist. In this way, Jesus establishes the priesthood and empowers the apostles and their successors to offer to the Father Christ's one sacrifice on the cross for the salvation of the world. So, um, <clears throat> so when he does this and he 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 does he says do this in remembrance of me well if you look at it and he is at that moment of life where they don't have to remember him he's alive he's clearly telling us to do this in the future and the catholic church is the only church that does this every single day seven days a week many different all hours of the day there's a mass going on worldwide and even though there is covid 19 now um masses are going on constantly um there is just no audience there it's just on the internet um, except for by internet, yeah. So if you look, you'll find Catholic Masses offering Eucharist every single day. Um, now, right now, we cannot physically take it, although some of the churches are opening now, but nevertheless, there are Masses going on in remembrance as Jesus instructed us now. Um, sometimes the protesters will do what they call a communion or maybe once a month their churches do that. And of course, it's not with apostolic um, succession. So, um, so then Jesus institutes the Eucharist. And when the hour came, he sat at, the, at table and the apostles with him and said to them, I have earnestly desired to, to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I shall not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the chalice, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on I shall not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he, had, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given up for you which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the chalice after supper, this chalice, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe is the man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to question one another, which of them would do this? So, as you know, we, we know who that person is, obviously. And, um, and they, you know, he's telling them clearly, um, we are, I'm not going to eat food again. This is it. He's telling them this is the last supper. This is the end. Um, and they obviously were not supposed to know that, but um, they were, you know, they were knowing that, um, he, you know, he had told them, look, this is coming. But they were still in a denial sense because, you know, they don't understand. So, um, here on the USCCB, it, um, it talks about, let's see, it talks about, um, the Last Supper, and the Passion Narrative is dependent upon Mark for the composition of the Passion narrative, but has incorporated much, uh, um, but Luke has incorporated much of his own special tradition in the narrative. Among the distinctive sections in Luke are number one, the tradition of, um, uh, where am I? Sorry. Um, 
the tradition of the institution of the Eucharist. Um, Jesus' farewell discourse, the mistreatment, that's number two, Jesus' farewell discourse. Um, the mistreatment and interrogation of Jesus, Jesus before Herod. So all that is coming up, um, but we are basically, you know, just uh, this beginning part. Um, so... Uh, Luke has identified the Last Supper of Jesus with the apostles as Passover, the Passover meal that commemorated the deliverance of the Israelites from slavery in Egypt. Um, Jesus reinterprets the significance of the Passover by setting it in the context of the kingdom of God. Um, right there, he's telling that. The deliverance associated with the Passover finds new meaning in the blood that will be shed. Um so now we're going to get into this amazing covenant. And as you can see, we're on the last one of the program. So let's get into this. Um, so basically, um, the, the Gospels record the Last Supper um, with Jesus' disciples. Um, and Jesus explained his approaching death um, in terms of a covenant. And um, Moses, uh, the, the same way that Moses sprinkled um, on the people to ratify the old covenant, the new covenant um, is recalling the prophecy of Jeremiah. Behold, the days are coming um, when I will make a new covenant for the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Um, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers, which I which I took them by my hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. So um, basically, um, you know that David comes from the eighth son of Jesse from the tribe of Judah. So um, that is, you know, from the prophecy. Um, Jeremiah recognized because of their fallen human condition, Israel was incapable of being totally faithful to the covenant. God would need to establish a new covenant that would involve a change in the human heart. Um, and that we, you know, that is baptism when we're baptized too. Um, uh, Jeremiah's prophecy goes on to say that this new covenant will be an unbreakable relationship, like when we get baptized um, with God. He will bring about through the forgiveness of sins. God's law will be written on people's hearts that they will know him personally. And the way do we know him personally? Eucharist. There is no other way of personal more than the Eucharist. That is the most personal relationship you can have with him. The sacrifice that ratifies the new covenant is the act of love in which Jesus died. The Eucharist functions as a communion meal and a permanent sign of the covenant. So that I thought was just beautiful. Um, and um, Jesus took it upon him due to our past, present, and future unfaithfulness. Um, Paul says... Uh, that Christ redeemed us from the curse of law to become the curse for us. Our profession of faith um, functions as a covenant oath, which we renew every time we repeat the creed or receive the sacraments. Um, the ancient Roman law, sacramentum, means oath. Sacramentum means oath. Like the covenants of Noah, Abraham, and David, the new covenant is a royal grant rather than a conditional covenant like the Mosaic covenant um, from Moses. Um, the church has become the bride and spouse to Christ, the bridegroom. He's made us a family. The new covenant in Christ fulfills all the covenants of the Old Testament. His resurrection inaugurates a new creation that will be brought to completion when he returns in glory. And Christ fulfills the covenant. Jesus, the new Adam, um, because of his obedience where Adam was uh, not obedient, Jesus in his obedience conquers that sin. 
Um, and he defeats the devil and destroys the power of death, bringing us grace and eternal life um, in its place. So um, in baptism, Jesus destroys the old humanity um, of original sin and um, brings us new everlasting life. Uh, he fulfills the covenant. Christ fulfills the covenant by extending God's grace to all nations. In you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Just as Abraham was accepted by God as righteous on the basis of his faith, we are as well. That doesn't mean that we don't have work to do. Um, it doesn't say by faith alone. Okay. Um, so uh, he... he fulfills this in several ways um, and starts a new relationship with God. We are redeemed not from slavery in Egypt, but from bondage to sin and Satan, the true slavery of the human race. Because before it was all about Egypt and, you know, and that's, that's, that was the focus, but now it's about our sin. And so it can't be by faith, just faith alone. We have to conquer that sin with Christ's help. Um, so uh, it's no longer the earthly promised land. It's the eternal life. That's the promised land today. So Jesus communicates um, his law in the Sermon on the Mount um, that just as Moses gave the law on Mount Sinai. So see that. He pairs that. I like the way Jeff Cavins pairs these things. Um, and the Ten Commandments before he, he goes beyond, but he goes beyond them, calling for a correspondence of the dispositions of the heart. Um, and that's about sin. The new law as loving God with one's whole heart and one's neighbor as oneself, um, not just uh, observances. Um, like the ritualists, you know, that the Jews do. It's not just about rituals. It, we must do more than that. Um, keeping the law of Moses uh, while also under the new covenant, God's grace received by faith. While this grace-based relationship with God through faith requires repentance from sin and living in love. It is not founded on keeping laws but on God's free gift accept and with love and obedience out of love not obedience out of rituals obedience out of love so um he goes on that God intended the law to be a temporary custodian and guardian for Israel and the role of the spirit dwelling in the hearts is to unite us to God give us understanding bring forth the fruit um, this is the law, the gospel, the grace of the spirit. Um, what's the continuing value of the law is Moses. It foreshadows it. Um, it will accomplish in Christ what God accomplished, God accomplishes through Christ. Um, it's moral teaching properly interpreted instructs us about what pleases God. And we are learning that clearly. Um, Jesus truly atones for sin. Um, once and for all, uh, the exterior ritual cleansing and hence needed to be repeated continually. That's what the Jews with their riches, their rituals had to be repeated constantly. Um, and then, uh, Christ also fulfills the covenant God made with, um, David. He promised David everlasting dynasty, but in 586, the monarchy was in ruins for centuries. It may have seemed as if God had forgotten his promises to David. Um, Jesus as David's final, um, heir, uh, has established the kingdom and elevated it to the universal kingdom, which universal means Catholic means universal. And in 107 AD, St. Ignatius of Antioch, in his letter to um, the, I don't know how to say this, the Smyrnians, um, who, uh, because he was a disciple of John the Apostle, and he wrote the letter that talked about the Catholic um, Church and the establishment of that. And that was um, 20 years or, or that was, um, uh, 
he was born 20 years after um, Jesus' death, and he died. Um, he was martyred in 110, I think. Um, so the Old Testament Passover sacrifice was not considered complete until the Israelites had eaten the lamb. The same is true of the New Testament Passover. We're called to partake in the New Covenant sacrifice in the Holy Eucharist. It is the Eucharistic meal, the same as um, the Israelites eating the lamb. It's the same. Um, the result is the communion with God that would have been unimaginable in earlier covenants. The liturgy allows us to enter into the Paschal mystery, Jesus' death and resurrection, making the past saving act perpetually present. And we have it constantly in all the masses that are offered. Um, and the new covenant has, um, uh, brings the baptized believers into a profound relationship with one another that supersedes all divisions. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. As God adopted sons and daughters who have been given his Holy Spirit, we are siblings to every other Christian and have special responsibility to care for one another as family members. Uh, St. Paul's most frequent term is brothers and sisters. Oops. So, um, he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. The teaching of Paul and John is about the special relationship among Christian Christians echoes that of Jesus. A new covenant I give to you that you love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love if you have love for one another so that is clearly what he's telling us um and i wanted to show you how the key um how those are the covenants how they get they include more and more people to the end where they include all gentiles um but let me look at these key events I wanted to show you. Um, yeah, this is all the good stuff in here. It's just amazing. The article, I mean, it's this Bible just will teach you everything you need to know. You have to get it. Um, those are our, our um, uh, narrative books, our 14 narrative books. Um, these are our 12 um periods um and we're going to read the supplemental books after we uh, and this is like a reading plan that he came out with um that we went a little beyond with this um he talks about how to interpret the bible i mean there's just just so much in here church teaching um prayer for reading um but where are the key events that's what i'm trying to find to show you events um let's see where are our key events oh okay so here are our key events see and I'm going to memorize them I think in tens because there are what um 70 70 yeah all right, is there more? Yeah, so 70. Um, so I'm going to memorize them in tens. Um, that's I like to memorize things like that. So um, we are getting toward the end, and tomorrow we will go past the covenant um, and go into the dispute about greatness. Okay? So I hope you have a wonderful day, and we will see you tomorrow.